What's that I smell? I wonder if it's dangerous. Those are questions that we had better be able to answer quickly and correctly. Our primary goal here at the water utility is to provide clean, safe water to our customers. To do that, we rely on a number of chemicals and processes that bring us in contact with contaminants and toxic substances that threaten our health. To do our job safely, it's important that we make sure the air we are breathing is just as safe and clean as the water that we are producing. We do that by using an air respirator whenever necessary. A respirator is a protective face piece, hood, or helmet designed to protect the wearer from harmful airborne agents or an environment without enough oxygen. Some of the most common hazards to employees' lungs are the presence of harmful fumes, dusts, vapors, and gases. These hazards can result in anything from a mild irritation to death. Because some of the most lethal gases or dangerous work environments provide no obvious warning to workers, it's important that we understand when a respirator may be necessary and which type provides us with sufficient protection. There are several different types of respirators used by utility workers, each one designed for a specific purpose. Here are some of the job duties at water utilities that require respirator protection. Working in confined spaces, working in or responding to leaks in areas containing chlorine, ammonia, ozone, and carbon monoxide, welding or burning, painting, using solvents, thinners, or degreasers, any work that generates harmful quantities of dust, including dust from lead, arsenic, fluorides, and asbestos, and laboratory work with hazardous materials. With proper training and by referring to the Material Safety Data Sheet, or MSDS, we can determine what type of respirator should be matched up with each job duty. Of course, you'll have to have an understanding as to what the various respirators are, so let's start with the air purifying respirators. These respirators remove air contaminants by filtering, absorbing, adsorbing, or by chemical reaction with the contaminants as they pass through the respirator or cartridge as we breathe. For example, a particulate removing respirator filters out dusts, fumes, and mists. A common example of this type of respirator is the disposable style used by painters. Held in place by straps, the mask traps respiratory hazards on the outside of the filter. Another type of air purifying respirator is a gas mask or chemical cartridge respirator. These are used to remove gas and vapors from the air we breathe by absorption, adsorption, or by chemical reaction as the contaminant enters the cartridge. The biggest advantage of all air purifying respirators is that because they are relatively small and lightweight, they barely impact a worker's movements. The biggest disadvantage is that you must constantly be aware of the need to replace a filter or cartridge as it has a limited lifespan. The cartridge can become saturated with the contaminants it is protecting you from. This is called breakthrough. Generally speaking, these air purifying respirators are used in job duties where the threat of respiratory hazard is evident, but it's not immediately dangerous to life or health, otherwise known as IDLH. If the contaminated atmosphere exceeds the cartridge or filter design specifications, you'll need an atmosphere supplying respirator. The two basic types of atmosphere supplying respirators are supplied air and the self-contained breathing apparatus. A supplied air respirator, or SAR, is a helmet or face piece that oil-free breathing air is supplied to through a hose from a source such as a tank or a compressor. The advantage of a supplied air respirator is that it provides a nearly limitless supply of clean air for workers to breathe. However, on the downside, because of the hose, mobility is restricted to the length of that hose. It can be difficult to use a SAR if the work area has machinery that will come in contact with the hose. An auxiliary escape air pack may be required as backup. In those instances, workers may prefer a self-contained breathing apparatus, or SCBA. This respirator has a back-mounted compressed air cylinder that is capable of providing breathing air to the user for a limited amount of time, usually from 30 minutes to as much as three or four hours. Without a hose, the worker's range is increased, 
although so is the weight he or she must carry along. This unit is most commonly used in emergency situations since it allows the user a source of safe breathing air in most any environment. The size of the tank does restrict movement in tight spaces. SCBAs are equipped with a pressure gauge or timer with an audible alarm, so the worker has a warning when the respirator is nearing the end of its service life. That's a brief rundown of the various types of respirators. Now, how can you be sure that the one you're using is safe and designed properly? Well, by law, it must be certified by the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. If it is, you'll find that the NIOSH symbol is on the respirator or packaging. Now, let's turn our attention to making sure that we use the respirator properly. It doesn't do us any good to have the right equipment if we use it the wrong way. The most important step in using a respirator is making sure it fits well. No single respirator will fit everyone. The respirator must be adjusted so that it creates a tight seal between the face piece and the face of the wearer. Before a worker is allowed to use a respirator, he or she must pass medical requirements and a fit test. This includes subjecting the worker to a harmless odor or irritant to see if it is detected inside the mask. This is called a qualitative test. The fit test also includes a quantitative analysis of the changes in air quality inside the mask as the test subject performs exercises that could cause leakage into the face piece. The fit test is repeated annually and at any time a change in the user's physical condition might impact the fit, such as extensive dental work or a loss of weight. The specifics of the fit test are found in OSHA's respiratory standard and it's the responsibility of your employer to make sure the fit test is conducted properly. However, it's your responsibility to make sure a quick seal check is done each and every time you use a respirator. A proper fit can be tested by performing a positive pressure or negative pressure user seal check. A positive pressure check is conducted by closing off the exhalation valve or the breathing tube with the palm of the hand. Exhale gently. If the respirator fits properly, a slight positive pressure will build up inside the face piece without any outward air leaking into the mask. The negative pressure check is accomplished by closing the inlet opening or breathing tube of the respirator and inhaling gently. If the face piece collapses slightly and no air from outside the mask enters, then you can assume it's working properly. A worker's physical characteristics may impact the proper fit of a respirator. A tight-fitting face piece should not be worn by employees who have facial hair as it may interfere with the seal. Bearded individuals can only use respirators with full hoods or helmets that do not rely on a tight face seal. Workers using respirators should be aware of warning signs of possible respirator failure. With particulate air purifying respirators, when breathing difficulty is noticeable due to partial clogging, the filter must be replaced. With gas or vapor air purifying respirators, any detection of odor, taste, eye irritation, or respiratory irritation should alert the user to leave the area immediately and check the equipment to see if the respirator cartridge is saturated. If the equipment seems to be in proper working order, then the contaminants of your work environment may have exceeded the cartridge design specification and a supplied airline or SCBA will be needed to complete the work. If an employee detects any odors or irritation when using a SAR or SCBA, he should immediately leave the work environment to check the respirator's seal, connections, lenses, straps, and other parts for signs of deterioration or damage. Respirators should also be inspected prior to and after each use. It's part of an ongoing maintenance, cleaning, and storage program that ensures the respirator will be safe and ready to use. Records should be kept of inspection dates and findings. Repairs should only be conducted by qualified persons using parts specifically designed for the respirator. SCBAs should be inspected at least once a month to make sure air cylinders are fully charged. A respirator that has been used should be cleaned and disinfected before it is reissued. Disposable respirators cannot be disinfected and so are assigned to only one person.
They should be discarded if soiled, damaged, or reach the end of their service life. Respirators should be stored to protect against dust, sunlight, heat, extreme cold, moisture, or chemicals. It's a good idea to place them in individual storage areas. If respirators are placed in bags, make sure they are dry because if they're damp after use or cleaning, a sealed bag may encourage microbial growth. Store respirators so that face pieces and exhalation valves will rest in a normal position to prevent rubber or plastic parts from reforming into an abnormal shape. Don't hang respirators on a peg because the straps will lose their elasticity over time. Emergency respirators should be kept accessible to work areas and stored in compartments that are clearly marked for use during emergencies. So now you know about the various types of respirators and how to make sure they fit and are ready to use. What else do you need to know? Everything you can find out about the work environment you plan on using the respirator in. Always keep in mind, respirators have their limitations and are not a substitute for effective engineering controls. When possible, exhaust the contaminant from the work area or substitute a highly toxic chemical with a less toxic chemical and use ventilation. Take the time to carefully assess your work environment. Determine the permissible exposure limit, or PEL, the threshold limit value, or TLV, and the short-term exposure limit, or STEL, of the chemicals and materials that you are working with. An MSDS will advise you of the average amount of a substance in the air you can be exposed to in an eight-hour work shift without suffering adverse health effects. The sheet will also advise you as to the type of respirator and appropriate cartridge for the chemical hazard. Changes in operating procedures, temperature, air movement, humidity, and work practices may influence the concentration of a substance in a work area. Periodic monitoring is needed to determine the air contaminant concentration. A work area should also be tested for proper oxygen levels. The air we breathe contains approximately 21% oxygen. When the oxygen level drops below 19%, a person experiences fatigue, poor coordination, and difficulty in breathing. Lower oxygen levels result in nausea, unconsciousness, and death. In cases where the work area is classified as immediately dangerous to life or health, it's required that an employee be located outside the dangerous environment and that visual or voice communication is maintained at all times to summon emergency rescue personnel if necessary. It's also important to realize that using an air purifying respirator under conditions of heavy work may result in distressed breathing and additional stress. Persons assigned to those tasks must be physically able to perform the work. A physician or healthcare professional can help evaluate a worker's ability to work under these conditions. It's a lot to remember, but don't worry. All of the information covered in this video is part of a utilities respirator program. Your employer is required to implement and maintain a written respiratory protection program to help you understand how you can work safely. The program includes written worksite specific procedures, hazard assessment, selection of respirators, fit testing, training, inspection, cleaning, maintenance, and storage, medical evaluations, work area surveillance, air quality standards, and program evaluations. Training of employees must be comprehensive, understandable, and recur at least once a year. A respirator is one of the most important tools you have in helping you complete your job duties at a water utility safely. As with any other tool, training and experience will help you develop the skills necessary to use this tool properly. Take the time and effort to do it right. Know what the hazards are and know what you need to do and be certain that you're protecting yourself from them. Get a big whiff of respiratory safety. You'll be better off for it.